Good morning, everyone. How are you today? On behalf of Pre General President Schaeberger and Secretary Treasurer Kelly, we welcome you to 2019 ALTS Conference here in Los Angeles. Uh, my name is Sean DeCrane. I'm retired out of Cleveland Fire after 26 years. I also represented the international in the building codes and standards arena for about 11 years. I've also been, now I'm with UL Underwriters Laboratories as the industry, or manager of industry relations and also uh, an advisory board member for Steve Kerber's Firefighter Safety Research Institute. My colleague here. Pete Van Dorp. Uh, I'm the fire chief in the Algonquin Lake and Hills Fire Protection District. That's a really big patch and a deep breath. I've uh, been there five years. Before that, I spent most of my career with the Chicago Fire Department, retired there in 2013 as chief of training. It's got nothing to do with why I'm here, though. I'm here because, much like Sean, we got engaged and involved with Dan and Steve back in 2006, 2007, when they were both still with NIST, doing research into fire dynamics and firefighter safety. And we've been able to watch them and be with them ever since. And so we're here to share with you what we've learned. So what we're going to try to do today is take 10 years of research and cramp it into about two hours. We obviously cannot cover all of this research in depth, so we're gonna to try to give you a 30,000 foot view of it, try to whet your appetite on this research. Uh, if you came into this room listening to us or expecting us to write your SOP for you or tell you how to be a firefighter, you're gonna be disappointed because we are not here to tell you how to fight fire. We are not telling you here, we're not going to be here to tell you this is the way that you have to do your job. Because there is no silver bullet in firefighting tactics, right? Every situation has a little bit of a different complexity. The goal is to create the education to give the firefighter and the fire officer the knowledge to make informed decisions on the fire ground. Now, some people have said this research may be a little controversial, maybe taking us in new directions. And that's okay. Discussions drive discussion. It, just, it, it drives knowledge. We want to understand what those discussions are. We want to understand what the questions are. But the one thing I've heard is that this research is done by a group of scientists in a vacuum that has no applicability to the real world. And that simply isn't true. Steve Kerber grew up in the fire service. His father and his grandfather were in the fire service. When Steve went to the University of Maryland, he lived in the fire station, rising to the rank of assistant chief. Each one of his team members has experience within the fire service. Keith Stakes, Robin Zavodic. Also, Dan Majorkowski spent over 30 years at NIST researching the science of fire, and more importantly, looking at firefighter line of duty deaths post-incident, trying to understand what occurred, scientifically what occurred, and then educate our firefighters so it doesn't happen again. Steve established an advisory board because it was very important to him to have that connection with the fire service, and that's where Pete and I sit. That advisory board is made up of 20 firefighters from not only across the U.S., but from around the world, as we have representatives from Germany, Sweden, and Japan that sit on our board. And as we were putting this group together, it was very important for us to establish what our goals were. What, we, what did we want to accomplish, right? And we've been blessed to be involved in a number of organizations and a number of efforts that say we want to reduce firefighter fatalities, but they really don't define how they're going to accomplish that. So we were able to accomplish that, and then more importantly, put it right into our mission statement. UL FSRI is dedicated to increasing firefighter knowledge to reduce injuries and deaths in the fire service and the communities they serve. We are going to reduce injuries and fatalities by educating our firefighters so they can make informed decisions on the fire ground, right? That we're not sitting there lock, stop, and barrel with SOPs that are strictly written and supposed to be followed to the letter regardless of the conditions that are being presented to them. I know a large metropolitan fire department that in the 2000s still had in their SOP on a residential house fire, you shall go through the front door. There is no indication of what if you have a 30 mile an hour wind coming from the seaside? It said you shall go through the front door. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Again, we wanna drive discussion if you're home or if you're at the firehouse watching this on the East Coast or in the Midwest or on the West Coast, we wanna drive that discussion. And at the end, we're gonna give you the location of additional resources. So we wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of the scope of one of our research projects. Ignition in five, four, three, Ignition confirmed. All right, we're coming up in two minutes. The ceiling temperature in the bedroom is reaching 300 degrees. Window 
window open. Front door open. So uh, just a little short clip of some research being done by FSRI, and as you can see from the video, full-scale fire test is often and whenever possible. And now they've actually transitioned to more acquired structure fire tests because we want to get out of that laboratory. We want a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more realism in the testing process. In any event, all of this research over the last 10 or 12 years has led to a lot of work, a lot of actionable items, and Steve Kerber put together some top, his top 20 a few years ago, and everything we're going to present today was stolen from him. Me and Sean never having had an original thought in our lives, we're lucky to hang around with a couple of smart guys, and we're going to steal what came from them and present it to you. Um, did I mention I was with the Chicago Fire Department for 33 years? Of course I did, right? Did I mention that we lost 46 guys in those 33 years? That's how many funerals I went to. And if I look up at that wall, and I did when I left, and I counted them, I counted the 46, and I looked and I asked for what? I got to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, I couldn't come up with a reason. I can tell you how. I might be able to tell you why, but I'm not sure I could tell you for what. In all those years and all those deaths and all those funerals, let me back up a little bit. Let me tell you this. In my last three years I was chief of training, I buried five. And I say I buried five, I certainly didn't do it myself, but as chief of training, I had to have a hand in that preparation of the funeral. And I can tell you that's very different than showing up. Um, it'll rip your guts out. Chicago's a big job, 4,500 guys. You can work a 33-year career and not meet half the people you allegedly work with. Um, in all those years and all those funerals, I never lost a friend. So the last guy I had to put in the ground, and that was Herbie. And this is Herbie on the left that you never wanted to meet because that's his, it sucks to be you look. Get in there, kid. Pick up the mop. Get that line, whatever, right? But if you Google Herbie to this day, you Google his name, you're going to find him with that shitty eating grin on his face. Those are the pictures you're going to see. He loved his life. He was that kind of guy. He was that guy. Everybody works with that guy. Herbie was that guy. You wanted to be in the hallway with him. You wanted to be on the roof with him. You wanted to be in the bar with him. You wanted him to have your back. He was that guy. He was one of the invincibles, and yet he died in as routine a fire as there is in the city of Chicago. And the fire killed Herbie Johnson. It wasn't cancer. It wasn't a traffic accident. The fire killed Herbie Johnson. And I'll tell you exactly how he died. One, he wasn't prepared when the event occurred because his trachea swelled shut from heat damage. That tells you part of the tale. At some point, he didn't have respiratory protection. But the real reason why he passed, what happened, ventilation got ahead of suppression. Nobody screwed up, nobody freelanced, nobody was doing anything wrong, but ventilation got ahead of suppression. And when that happens, the fire grows. And sometimes when the fire grows, it goes whoosh and boom, and that's what happened at Herbie's fire. And that blew the door down between him and the event, and there he was, not, pre not prepared. Just like that. And the reason I take the time, we don't have enough time for all this, and I'm killing a lot of time to tell you about Herbie and how he died, but it's important because you have to understand that if it can happen to a man like Herbie Johnson, it can happen to any last one of us. You just can't know enough. And I have a lot of patience. You can't be in a job for 39 years without developing some kind of patience, but I have no patience for the guy that knows it all and thinks that his 30 years of experience tells the whole tale. You can't know enough. So thank you for being here, because you're demonstrating that you understand that. It's not just Herbie. In my dad's era, did I mention my dad was on the job for 40 years? God bless him, he's still with us. In my dad's era in the 1970s, cotton gloves, canvas coats with asbestos lining, three-quarter boots, leather helmets, no, no respiratory protection, no training to speak of. My dad's training in the Chicago Fire Academy was close order drill, rules and regulations, and physical fitness. That fire stuff, you'll learn that from your lieutenant, kid. 
And yet, with all those deficiencies, their death rate was 1.8. And our death rate, with everything we have and all the training we have and all the equipment we have, is up by 50%. Clearly, we're missing something. Something's changed. Something's different. We are killing more firefighters on the fire ground than ever before, per fire. Plain, simple fact. Let's do something about that. <clears throat> and the way that UL and FSRI, and by extension, Sean and I are going to try to do something about that, is to convince you that knowledge is every bit as important or perhaps more important than belief. And certainly it's as important as your experience. All right? I was always taught ventilation equals cooling. Cool the environment. You ventilate the cool. Guess what? The, the physics argues against that. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Doesn't make ventilation wrong, makes timing and sequencing critically important. Ventilation in the absence of suppression, guess what's going to happen? Remember this, the fire triangle, what happens when I take air away? You can speak, what happens when I take air away? Fire goes out. What happens when I add air? Fire grows. Period. Not if, when, or but, period. If you're going to ventilate, you have to be prepared to suppress immediately, not five minutes later. Ask Kirby. Right? There's another list of all kinds of stuff up there. Right? The whole idea of all this is to challenge our assumptions, to ask why. If you ask why and you come up with the answer you always had, God bless you, have at it. But ask why. That's the important part. There's a number of people out there that claim that UL is saying, never ventilate, never go inside. That's the best one. They're trying to turn us into a bunch of lawn fairies, you know, everything from the outside. I've been working with these guys for 12 years. I never heard any one of them say anything remotely like anything on this list. All right. What we're saying is, is that we can learn stuff in the laboratory. We can learn stuff through research that we can only learn there. And I can give that to you and help you make better decisions on the fire ground. Fair enough? I hope so. This is a great model right here. Recognition, sign, uh, recognition prime decision making, OODA loops, all these sorts of things that we use to make decisions on the fire ground are fundamentally just like what you see up on the screen. You have a plan, you train on it, you apply it, you critique it, you revise it. What's this wholly dependent upon, though, traditionally, is that experience. Who's going to more fires than ever before? Not too many of us, right? And what are we doing about that? I can't fix all of that, but what I can help you with, I can, I can make this research available to you. FSRI can make this research available to you to help make up for that lack of experience and help you make better decisions on the fire ground. Fair enough? Want to dig into it? Let's have at it. So just one quick point on that uh, to build on what Pete was saying. We critique a lot or revisit our uh, incidents at this kitchen table. And that's great. Informal critique is great, right? We always talk about what went right. We don't always talk about what went wrong. But after we sit there and talk and critique about an incident, especially an incident that may have gone wrong, we want to make changes. We want to make changes to our SOPs. The challenge that we have, are we making those changes based on what we believed occurred on the fire ground? Or are we basing those changes on what we can demonstrate knowingly through research of what occurred on the fire ground? And so what we're going to cover today a little bit, uh, again, at the high level, is just an update on our latest, uh, uh, latest research project on fire attack. Because we really want to understand what is occurring. And as I'll show you here, we can run the same scenario in, in, the, in the same house and change one variable. We're gonna open one window. We're gonna open two windows. We're gonna open a door. And as you saw in that video, we're gonna use a straight line. We're gonna use a, a narrow fog. Uh, we're gonna use a wide fog. We're gonna move that hand line around. What are the effects of all of those to the performance of fire, the behavior of fire? More importantly, how does it help us or hinder us from accomplishing what our goals are? Uh, as we showed in the video, that's in Building 11 in Northbrook, Illinois. It's one of the largest fire labs in North America. Uh, we can adjust it. We built two houses inside that laboratory. So uh, these are all full scale. And we talked about the advisory board, but each one of these research projects has a technical panel. That technical panel is made up of you. There, there will be a call that goes out on Thursday or Friday for the uh, search and rescue technical panel. And if you follow the social media or if you go to the website, you'll see this. We're looking from firefighters across the country to be participants so you help shape the research. So we had a, a model home we've used in the ventilation, vertical ventilation, horizontal ventilation. In the fire attack, the technical panel wanted to see a longer hallway. You all modified that floor model to uh, accommodate what the technical panel wanted to see. 
that technical panel drafts that, what the, the, those research projects look like. So they're critically important to the success of the research. And in each one of these projects, uh, they're funded through FEMA and the Assistance to Firefighter Grant, which covers the participation of US firefighters. But UL will invest at least $1 million of its own resources to ensure that that project is completed or as fully as we, as we can. We'll pay for firefighters from other countries to come in that may have an expertise in that field. We've seen firefighters from Australia, from Spain, from the UK, from Ireland, uh, Canada, uh, Netherlands have all participated in these research projects. Just in the fire attack real quick, because uh, you know I'm looking at the time. Uh, this is an example of how many different scenarios we'll run. Experiments one through six right here had a closed door and then it was an interior attack. Experiments seven through 12 had the open window and an interior attack. Those red crosses are the location of the occupants where we were using pig skin to measure the exposure to heat, to humidity, and other contaminants. We were also measuring exposure to gases in these locations. Uh, experiments 13 through 17 was a two-room fire with an interior advance. Experiments 17 and 18 was a bedroom fire with an open window and a transitional attack. And the remaining experiments, 22 to 24, were two bedrooms fully vented with, an ex with a transitional attack. When we talk about transitional attack, we're referring to the initial application of water from an exterior position in this situation. Remember, it's, when we talk about transitional attack, we're not saying it always has to be from the outside. We talk about getting water on the fire as quickly as possible from the safest location as possible. Start resetting that environment. Actually, what we've really learned is you don't need a ton of water to actually accomplish what we're trying to do. You have to put it in a timely place, in the right place. Uh, one of the things we wanted to look at is the effectiveness uh, of transitional versus interior attacks, right? So we looked at the, the, the interior attack, and you see the fire growth here. And you can see these lines. I know it's kind of difficult to see, but I think the, this presentation will be available for download. Uh, so you can look at it post, uh, post presentation or post alts. But you see what happens when we start to put water on the fire, the temperature drops. Did the same evolution with the transitional attack. When you put water on the fire, temperature drops. So really what the research is saying, Pete is right. No one in FSRI that wears this badge has said, always throw water from the outside. You always have to use a transitional attack. What the research is telling us is we have to get water on that fire as quickly as possible. So if you pull up on a structure and that fire is on the seaside in the back corner, it might take you a heck of a long time to go around to the back corner to get water on that fire. The best option may be going through that front door and initiating an interior attack. But in the same case, if that fire is at, in this bedroom right here and that window's open and it's exposing itself, the best option may to put water right there from the exterior on that fire and start to knock it down. And when you start to put the water in the right place, you don't need a ton of water. When we start to look at these scenarios, we actually saw success in a scenario with one room ventilated with a transitional attack used as little as 31 gallons to complete extinguishment. We saw another situation with a two room vent where they used 257 gallons. Are we bringing 257 gallons to the scene? Most times we are. So we can be efficient. It's not to say you shouldn't secure a secondary water supply. That is not the message here. It is simply saying that we can accomplish a lot when we do it correctly. Can you initiate fire attack and search at the same time? Well, if we start to look at the effectiveness of your water line and what your, the, uh, the impact on the, the tenable atmosphere, as soon as you start to bring that fire under control, whether it's an interior attack, you start to improve conditions throughout the structure. Uh, obviously, high hazard area here in red, which is unsustainable for life, but you have the caution area in yellow right there. So you, you see, as you do a transitional attack, you start to bring those conditions into a tenable atmosphere uh, much more rapidly. Uh, but again, if this scenario is switched and this fire was in this back corner over here, that interior attack may be more effective timely-wise. Again, it's, it's all about having the tools in the toolbox, right? The research is telling us we have options. 
So Pete covered some statistics at the national level. And I think this makes it a little bit, well, it's the mood lighting is, is setting in. For those of you at home, you haven't seen, the, the lights have darkened. But uh, we wanted to give it a little bit more of a personal look. We have two members from the FDNY on our executive or on our advisory board, Captain John Cirillo and Deputy Chief George Healy. And we were discussing the impact of the modern fire environment and firefighter safety. How is this impacting our firefighter safety? So John decided to do some research and he was looking at fire ground fatalities within the FDNY, within the FDNY uh, line of duty deaths. And he looked at two 25 year periods. So he took the first set of years, 1958 to 1983, and he identified 202 line of duty deaths. Now, I'm not a math major, but that's a significant number of deaths, line of duty deaths, right? Eight firefighters a year they were losing. And this is their war years, right? We, we read books about them. In 1972, they responded to 47,000 working structure fires. So what John wanted to understand, out of these 202 line of duty deaths, how many of these firefighters got caught in a flow path? How many of them got caught in a rapid fire event? And when he researched each one of these incidents, he was able to identify four. So I said it was a comparative, right? So he's looking at two 25 year periods. So he looked at a subsequent 25 year period, 1985 to 2010. And he identified 52 line of duty deaths. Now, obviously, the 343 brothers we lost on 9-11 were not included in this. And that's not to disrespect their memory or diminish their loss. We're simply looking at two comparative set of years. So this was, this was an event that occurred, unfortunately. So John identified 52 line of duty deaths. And so we saw a significant reduction in line of duty deaths. But if you look in 2003, they responded to 26,000 working structure fires. So a significant reduction in number of fires they were responding to. But with 202 line of duty deaths, John identified four. With 52 line of duty deaths, John identified 15 that were caught in a rapid fire event, right? A significant increase. And this doesn't include the brothers we lost on Black Friday. It was a rapid fire event that forced him out of that upper story window, but technically it was the traumatic fall that killed three of our brothers. So they were not included, or this number could be 18, or it could be even higher than that. Now, obviously, this was a cause of discussion for us. Uh, it was also a cause of discussion within the FDNY. What is leading to these increased fatalities from traumatic injury, from rapid fire events? Is it an experience going to 20,000 less structured fires a year? Could that be driving it? Is it the lack of training? NFPA 1403, how many follow NFPA 1403 in your live fire training? Legal's in the room, so every hand should go up, right? Um, right? It, it states that we have to use clean wood products. And why is that? Because we've lost firefighters in training exercises. Because we can't use the number one material that we encounter on the fire ground every single day, upholstered furniture. Because it's a flammable solid and it's too too volatile for us to use in our training exercises. And this is not to say we have to change 1403 whatsoever. It's to recognize the limitations that we have in our live fire training and lessons that we can learn out of that live fire training and then appropriately apply them. And we just released two reports on, on, on training fires and they're available on the website. The new generation, sorry guys, ladies, you just don't get it. The new generation just doesn't get it, right? And that, that was my case when I got on 20, almost 30 years ago. That was Pete's case when he got on 60 years ago. It's, um, <laughs> sorry, but you know, <laughs> you can tell who the, the labor schmuck is up here and the, the nice well-dressed chief. But um, so it, it's not to say that the new generation doesn't get it. They do, if you look online, if you go to these conferences, they're engaged. They wanna know why. When I was our chief of training, I had all, our, all these young folks coming through. They, they want to know why. They're eating us up. I guess we just have to learn how to communicate a little bit better through our generations. But that's been true for, for years, right? The SCBA. The SCBA is allowing us to go into places Pete's father could not go into. That's absolutely true, right? But why Billy Goldfeder is a handsome man, we're not going back to the days of the bussy mustaches and beards that we dip in water and use as filtration devices. In fact, when you go to Kenny Fent's presentation, uh, you'll see that we're not using our SCBAs enough, right? We should be wearing them more. The bunker gear, the bunker gear is the whole problem. Right. 
And this was, this was a big discussion within the FDNY too, and if there's anybody here from the FDNY, they could probably confirm that, because the FDNY didn't have full bunker gear until 1994. And that was a result of an incident in Manhattan that killed three firefighters. Chicago got it in 2006. So George Healy responded to that fire, and I can't do the fire justice enough, but he said when Captain John Drennan, that rock of a, uh, of a truck captain, loses his life in a rapid fire event in a hallway because they're popping the skylight, and he had a ventilation limited fire that transitioned to flashover, and right, high pressure to low pressure, you create that outlet, and our firefighters were in that hallway. He survived for 40 days in the burn units so with Third, degree, third and fourth degree burns over 60% of his body. And Rudy Giuliani came in and he saw Vina Drennan sitting there. And Vina Drennan is an incredible advocate for our safety. Saw her sitting there all 40 days with her husband. And Captain Drennan sitting there burns right down to the bone. Right? Said, Get these men their gear. Get these men their turnout gear. And that subsequently led to the full, and full outfitting of the FDNY. So John really wanted to look at it. And that was before Giuliani, oh, I can't say that, we're on live stream. So John looked at these 15 fatalities, right? How many were the pre-issuance of bunker gear? How many were the post? And what he identified is seven were pre-issuance of bunker gear, eight were post. So does, does this say, oh yeah, the bunker gear is a contributing factor? Or does it dispel that belief that the bunker gear is a contributing factor? To me, what it's saying is if we want to reduce the 80,000, 70,000 injuries, if we want to reduce fatalities, it's a multi-pronged approach. There is no silver bullet here. We have to know our bunker gear. We have to know the limitations of our bunker gear. We have to educate our firefighters. We have to train our firefighters. We have to be involved in understanding our work environment, how our work environment is going to be performing. So we have to understand building construction. We have to be involved in codes and standards to ensure that our work environment is up to the safest levels that we can, and we can ensure that our equipment is going to protect us and perform when it's required. And that requires our, activ our activities. I hope you're starting to see that what we're really after here is how can the research inform our decisions? What can, we, what can we reach out to? What can they provide us that we can't get anywhere else? Our experience can't teach us these things. We need our experience and knowledge to go together so we can make better decisions on the fire ground and better decisions about our gear and our equipment and how we use it and what its limitations are. And I'll give you a couple of more examples. The chief propeller head himself, Steve Kerber, will tell you, don't rely on your technology. If you don't have a fundamental understanding of your work environment, your technology is not going to save you. And he's the geek of all geeks, okay? In a lot of cases, if you look at the upper left, the lower left, the upper right, our gear hasn't really changed all that much during our careers or our father's careers. It's, it's become more advanced and more sophisticated, but it really isn't all that different. On the other hand, the lower right, we do have some gear that's very, very different than ever before, but it also has its limitations. Let me give you a quick example. How does your turnout gear work? Could anybody tell me? Anybody want to volunteer one? Shout it out. Yeah, everybody talks about what it does. It's a barrier, okay? That doesn't tell you. How, how does it work? What makes it a barrier? This is how it works. Your gear is an energy storage system. It stores energy. It collects it. It holds it within the gear so that it doesn't get to you in a shorter period of time as it would otherwise, right? It's not a force field. It doesn't reflect it. It doesn't bounce it back. It stores it. What happens when your gear is stored all the energy it can store? Mayday, mayday, mayday. Not I start getting hot. No, mayday, that's what happens. Like that. Okay? If you understand that and you're uncomfortably hot in a working environment and you're not performing a critical fire ground function, does that inform your decision? I would hope so. Because you're running out of time. And when you discover you're out of time, you won't be able to respond appropriately. That's what this should tell you. It's an inherent flaw in your gear. It's about its design. It's, it's got nothing to do with the manufacturer or the materials or any of that. It can only store so much. And it's really not very good at letting it go. Here's an example of that. This is a recreation of a training line of duty death. And you're going to see one of the training officers repeatedly enters the room to stoke the fire, and when he comes out, take a look at his gear compared to the guy that stayed out of the room. And you'll notice that when he comes out and stays out, his gear stays white in the, in the image, right? What does that tell you? That it's staying hot, right? It's not releasing that heat energy. It's storing it. So when this fire flashes over, which one of these guys doesn't come out alive? 
the guy with the preheated gear, even they, they were both in the same location when the event occurred. All right? Does that help inform your decision on the fire ground? Should your firefighters not be taught how their gear works? Not just what it does, but how it does it. Yes, I think they should be. What's the weak link in our SCVA, or uh, gave it away. What's the weak link in our PPE? People will say the face piece, and, and you're, you're right for all intents and purposes. The piece of polycarbonate in the face piece technically is the weak link, because that will fail the soonest. And what you're watching here is an experiment designed to test the polycarbonate in an SCBA face piece. And what you're going to see, it's on a breathing mannequin. And what you're going to see is that as the, the face piece starts to fail, it becomes hot. It starts to collect energy and store energy. It starts to craze. It starts to melt. It starts to deform. And can you see it moving back and forth? Can you see the little hole developing right about there in the face piece? Would it surprise you to know that this face piece, and it's much smaller than it looks in the video, would it surprise you to know that this face piece passes the test? Well, how can that be? Because the test is a performance test. This test wants to know, can the system supply positive pressure under these conditions for however many minutes? And yes, it can. Even with a hole in it, it's providing enough pressure to supply you with fresh air and you could leave that environment. What happens if you touch this face piece? All of a sudden, it doesn't work so good, right? It's not a little hole anymore. It comes off the ensemble. And what do we all intuitively do when we can't see out of our face piece? Does this help inform your decisions on the fire ground? You see where we're getting at, right? When we can really learn what's going on and really understand how our gear works and what its limitations are, we can make better decisions. And just to that point, we've had in that specific incident and others, we have firefighters after the post-incident uh, review, they found polycarbonates in their gloves. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we know that firefighter is starting to wipe at that face shield. They're under duress, they can't see where they're going. Here's another example of how the research can inform us, because it can give us a new vocabulary, it can give us a new language, it can help us understand and talk and discuss amongst ourselves about what's really going on in our environment. We talk about temperature all the time. How hot was that fire? I heard that fire was 1,500 degrees. Guess what? They're all 1,500 degrees to 2,000, right? And a large part, of, even a candle flame can be 1,500 to 2,000 degrees. It's not about the degrees. That's a piece of the puzzle, but that's not. It's really about energy. It's about heat release rate. What's the temperature of one candle? 500 to 1,400 degrees centigrade. What's the temperature of 10 candles? 500 to 1,400 degrees centigrade, right? But 10 candles clearly give off more heat energy than one. So we have to change the discussion, and the research is giving us the vocabulary and the language and the understanding that we can change the discussion and become more, more informed. Another way in, in, in which the research is helping us understand our equipment a little better is with thermal imaging cameras. Why did we bring thermal imaging cameras into the fire service? To do what thing? Find people, okay? What, what have we adapted them to do as well? Find fire. Right? Hidden fire in the wall, ceilings. How about the floor? How does that work? Works pretty good on the wall, works pretty good on the ceiling. How about the floor? Not so much. And why not? Because of the thermal insulation on the floor, right? Subfloor, air gap, finish floor. Even worse, subfloor, air gap, carpet padding, air gap, carpeting, traps, and it's, a, it's like your bunker gear. It's an insulating system, right? That, that hides the, the signature from your thermal imaging camera. So you could be looking at a floor system and you think the floor system is just fine and dandy and yet you've got failure temperatures below you. Who's seen that video at UL? Who's seen that information? Let me see the show of hands. Not nearly enough. That's 13 years old. That's not a shame on you, that's a shame on me. I haven't gotten the message out. 13 years ago, we learned that thermal imagers can't reliably predict what's going on underneath you in a floor system simply because the floor system itself is such a good insulator. 13 years ago, okay? This information has been available to us for a long, long time. Another thing we're looking at is our training props, okay? And our training systems and how they can set us up for failure. Don't get me wrong, live fire training is wonderful. Do as much as possible. So as much acquired structure, training tower, as much live fire training as you can, understand the one thing you can't learn there. You want to guess the one thing you can't learn on the live fire training? Fire dynamics. 
You can't learn about fire because you're not burning what you're going to experience on the fire ground. You can do all kinds of great things and have a great experience and learn all kinds of stuff under stressful conditions and do all that great stuff, but the fire dynamics themselves will not accurately replicate the fire ground unless you go to extraordinary effort to do so. Guys in L.A. County have been doing that for several years now. What are those extraordinary efforts, and how do we teach each other how to do that in our training towers, make, make good replication of fire dynamics? We're trying to figure that out through some of the research. Okay. What do you know about fire? What do you, speaking of fire dynamics and fire, what do, where do we spend all of our training time? EMS in most places. But when you finally get around to the firefighting part, where do you spend most of your training time? I hope you spend it with tools and equipment. I hope you, you spend it mastering your craft. And that's wonderful and that's great, but if you haven't mastered the knowledge bases along with the craft, you can get yourself in some serious trouble. I don't know what you do locally, but the national standard doesn't even require any fire dynamics training or any building construction training when you move from firefighter to fire officer. It's not mandated. Do you mandate it for your officers? How long does it take before your firefighter gets made officer and you put him in charge of a crew? How many years go by? Five, 10, 15? Has anything changed on your fire ground in 15 years? Maybe we need to send ourselves back to school on fire dynamics and building construction so we better understand what's going on. How many carpenters in the room? Electricians, plumbers, roofers, you know, guys that come out of the trades. When I came on the job, that would have been the whole damn room by the time I got that far. We used to bring an institutional knowledge of the built environment to the kitchen table every single morning. And that doesn't happen anymore. What are we doing to make up for that? How are we teaching guys about their built environment? Most of our training curriculums still assume that we're all tradesmen. Yeah, getting some head nod, right? And it just isn't happening anymore. So think about that. Think about what you can do differently. <clears throat> Here's a quick example, right? Is a training tower and ventilation. Can I make this training tower god-awful hot? And can I do it legally? Especially on a hot summer day by the fourth or fifth burn, this building itself is very, very hot. Okay, and if I overventilate this building and I have this very hot environment, but all I have is a nice legal fire set of hay and pallets in the corner, when I overventilate the building, what's likely to happen to that environment? It's likely to get better because there's really very little fuel in that building, even though it might be hellacious hot. So what am I teaching my firefighters, right? You get in a building, it's hellacious hot. What have I taught them to do? Open up, open up, open up, open up. And if they do that on the fire ground, what's going to happen? They're going to drive that to flash over and we're going to be burning guys. So we have to understand the limits of our training environment and make sure that we're bounding that understanding so guys don't come out with the wrong idea. Still me? I got this one. You got this one. All right. Take a breather. So um, as Pete's talked about, we're training in these non-combustible structures where we can make decisions or make maybe uh, poor decisions without even knowing that decision was made because our work environment continues to evolve. And we've seen this evolution uh, over time, but it seems to accelerate. It seems like we can't even keep up with the changing building materials and the changing building systems that are coming to the market. We're seeing larger homes. We're seeing homes that typically 20 years ago, the, the average American home was about 1,600 square feet. Today, that average American home is about 2,500 square feet. In 2006, 28% of the homes that were built in the United States were over 3,000 square feet. We're talking commercial sized properties here. We're seeing large open spaces in these homes. Uh, and my house was built 21 years ago. Um, you walk in the front door, there's not a solid wall on that first floor except for the bathroom. We like that open area to socialize, right? And it's great. But it also allows that, that fire to have access to the air and other combustible materials within that compartment. We lose that built-in compartmentation we had in houses that were built 50 years ago. We're seeing the evolving fuel loads, the thermoplastics, the polyurethane foam furniture, um, synthetic products. We're seeing changing building materials. We're seeing engineered systems. We're seeing 3D printed homes come into the marketplace. Some use a bioplastic material, some use a cementious based material. We're seeing these smaller lots, we're seeing different technologies. All this leads to faster fire propagation, shorter time to flash over, and shorter escape times for those occupants. If that occupant has a shorter time to escape, 
Guess what is required of us when we arrive on that scene, right? It drives that decision-making to life safety and, and forces our crew to operate in those dangerous conditions. Uh, home sheathing. There's nothing in the code that requires you to have solid materials anywhere on, that, on the exterior of that house. You're required to meet the ability to carry and distribute the load. You're, a, you're required to carry and distribute the snow load for your region and the wind load for your region. So if I can carry and distribute the load and I put cross bracing in, I literally can put cardboard on the outside of that home. The only thing that I'm required to do is meet the R performance values. So then I'm gonna to start to put some insulated foam on the exterior and then maybe I'll cover it with vinyl siding. And that's what we're seeing today as it evolves. Uh, old growth lumber to new growth lumber. Believe it or not, it's, your not, it's not your daddy's wood anymore. We're seeing today the marketplace, we, have, we engineer our trees to grow faster. That home that was built 50 years ago used a tree that was about 150 years old, was 36 inches in diameter when it was harvested. That home that has been built in the last 20 years is using a tree that's 18 to 22 years old and is harvested when it gets to 18 inches in diameter. So we're seeing a difference in performance, whether it's engineered or it's dimensional. Just because it's dimensional, don't get comfortable. Don't get cocky. Uh, we're seeing these changing materials are leading to firefighter fatalities and leading to firefighter injuries, right? It's a changing dynamic on the fire ground. So the Vinyl Siding Institute is a trade organization, and they spent a lot of money in recent years to educate the fire service and, and the public that their material is a high heat performer. They've determined it's a high heat performer because it will not propagate flame until it's exposed to temperatures of 850 degrees Fahrenheit. We start to look at the temperature of fire, we start to understand that that 850 degrees Fahrenheit is easily achieved when it's an exposure. So we're seeing this exposure from, uh, and we're talking about smaller lot lines and bigger homes, right? That three foot separation from the lot line, uh, only six feet, puts us in conditions like this. So that vinyl siding is designed to do what under high heat conditions? Shrink up and fall away, right? So the real challenge that we're seeing is not necessarily the vinyl siding, it's what we're putting underneath it. And this is polyisocernate foam. This is typically what you'll find on the exterior of a home that's covered by the vinyl siding. This is real time. This is not sped up. This is a corner test, very similar to an NFPA 286 test. And as Pete was talking about, look at the energy. Look at the energy that's driving that. Right? So we, I was talking about you all in our research projects. We were looking at exterior fires. We've seen a number of exterior fires throughout the country that we've lost multifamily housing in, housing that was sprinklered because it was 13R system. The attics were not sprinklered. We saw residential fires where firefighters were injured or killed. Or we lost residents. And we put a technical panel together saying, what are your challenges? What are, you, what are you facing out there? So we wanted to see, uh, and this is all direct feed from our technical panel, what are they going through uh, in regards to these exterior fires and the rapid transition to the attic? So the, the wall on the left is um, plywood with uh, the vinyl siding on it. The one in the middle is uh, plywood with uh, one inch polystyrene, rigid polystyrene foam and the vinyl siding. And the one to the farthest to your right is half inch poly, rigid polystyrene foam, but it has a sprayed polyurethane foam attic space. So we're seeing a move in many areas to go to a conditioned attic space with a sprayed polyurethane foam throughout the attic, seal it, and then condition that from the living quarters. So as you see in that little box, that little insert, that's the inside of the attic. This is a 100 kilowatt fire. This is simply a small wastebasket fire that's exposed to the exterior of the home. So you see, at one minute and 51 seconds, we have fire propagating from the exterior to the interior. Now in a longer presentation, we can give you examples where we show a fire rolling in the attic and every firefighter's doing what? Going through the front door. They wanna to get to that attic fire, but they're not putting water on the source, right? And I don't care if it's your first line, I don't care if it's your second line, I don't care if it's your third line. Get water on the source of your fire because your firefighters are up there getting their butts kicked in that attic and they're just, they're just maintaining pace. They have to get water on the source. And that's what some of the research is starting to educate us on, right? We can pass that information on. And we have a training program on exterior fires and attic fires. <clears throat> Boss? 
We didn't, we didn't give this or anything else we're going to do today anywhere near <laughs> the time it deserves. Building construction classes and what's changing in, building, in your built environment needs to be talked about every day, every week, all part of your training program. We're trying to just tickle the senses a little bit. Do you get the idea that everything in your built environment is changing? It's not about the gusset plates. All right? There's a young kid in the back of the room here somewhere that as dumb and young as he is, is one day going to be up on this stage making a presentation, and he's going to say, back in the day, we didn't have that lightweight crap you guys got. We had real two-by-four gusset-plated trusses. You know what I mean? It's already true. In a lightweight built environment, that's the most robust thing on the market. Everything else is less massive, which means it'll fail faster. It's not about the component issues, it's about the lack of mass. We're engineering the mass out of our buildings better than ever before, and we're stuffing them with more fuel that's more volatile than ever before. And that is not going to change. The environment's going to continue to change. Everything about it. Don't lose sight of that. One of the things that ha hasn't changed is wind impacting fire. Why do we need to talk about this? It's been going on for as long as there's been fire and buildings and wind, they've impacted one another. Well, what's changed is the fuel loads, right? When I put that much more volatile fuel in my house, every bit of wind that impacts that, whether it's just natural ventilation or actually a wind event on the fire ground because I got a storm coming through or a high wind condition, seriously impacts that fire. Name me something in your house that isn't predominantly plastic. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, right? You know, maybe the dining room table coated in polyurethane. Maybe the toilet is the last piece of porcelain in your bathroom, but you see the point, right? We are all, we are all immersed in petroleum products, and that stuff responds to oxygen and, and wind in particular much more dramatically than na natural products do. So that's what's changed is our fuel load has changed. And because of that, we have to be much more respectful of the impact the wind's going to have on our fire. Carl Wilson is still dead. And he's going to remain dead. And he died on the second floor of this 6,000 6, square foot house. And when they got on the scene, it was 6 o'clock in the morning with a car in the driveway. And they had every reason to believe somebody could be home at this time. And they went inside with a charge line, went to the second floor to do nothing but clear that second floor. The fire was all on the back of the house, so they thought, from what they could see. And while they were up there trying to clear that second floor, the attic, the fire had gotten driven up into the attic by the... 40 mile an hour wind on the back of the building, that attic flashed and dropped everything down on him. Kyle didn't come out. It happens. And there's nothing you can do about it when it happens. You've got to learn to see it coming. We need to spend more time on this kind of stuff. There's two guys still dead in Houston, Texas, same sort of situation. Knew exactly where their fire was. Fire was in the attic. They had a hole in the roof. They had the ceiling punched down. They had two lines inside on the fire. The window failed, completely changed the conditions because all of a sudden, literally all of a sudden, 20 miles an hour worth of wind is feeding all that petroleum. Take yourself a nice plastic gasoline fire or something and blow a fan over it and take a look at what happens. It, it's horrific. And it happens on our fire, and it's happened historically a lot more than we think because we didn't know what to call it. We didn't have a name for it. We do now, and we're realizing that it's happening pretty frequently. And this gets us to this whole idea about ventilation-limited fires. The fact of the matter is, is that every, every fire we go to, you need to assume is a vent-limited fire. And what does that mean? What am I trying to convey to you? This is what I'm trying to tell you, is that that fire doesn't have enough oxygen. If I took all the plastic crap in your house or all the plastic, all the, all the synthetic material in this room, took it outside, piled it up, and lit it on fire where it can get all the air it needs, right? It's getting air from 360 degrees. There's a nice breeze outside. What's coming off that column of fire? What's coming off that pile of crap out there? What are we seeing, though? Big bunch of flame and big giant column of black smoke, unburned fuel. Even with all the air it can possibly get, all the oxygen that possibly be available to it, it still can't burn clean. That's the nature of the petroleum fuel. It needs more than 21% air and oxygen to burn clean. That's why we pre-mix our methane in, inside our house before we burn it. Right? It's always going to need more oxygen, and every opening we make in the building is going to give it more oxygen, and that's going to grow that fire. That's the lesson, and that's what we got to start wrapping our heads around. Just because it's venting doesn't mean it's vented. More air will always lead to more fire growth. 
We used to historically talk about this growth uh, curve on the left. That's a campfire. That's a fuel-limited fire. It grows, it's fully developed, it runs out of fuel, it slowly burns down. Inside a building, especially today, you have to anticipate this. The fire becomes underventilated because it runs out of air first. There's still plenty of fuel that runs out of air, though. And then when we take that front door to go in and do what we got to do, what are we giving it? Right? And this is the change that we want to make, right? Is this talking about, we used to historically just talk about ventilation as out, out, out. Get the bad stuff out. Ignoring what we're letting in. And the whole discussion about flow pass and vent limited fires is to get us engaged in this discussion that you can't ventilate the bad stuff out without letting an equal amount of oxygen in. And that oxygen you're letting in is going to grow the fire faster than you can vent it. That's the simple physics. No getting around it. And it's not just the front door. Every opening you make, and we can demonstrate this again and again, every opening you make can lead to another event. It adds more air, thins out that fuel, gives that system what's going on in that box, more oxygen, and you can trigger another event. If you are not suppressing or if you are venting without suppressing, you're going to lose. That's what it comes down to. And I wasn't taught that. I don't know about you, but I wasn't taught that. I was taught vent. Get the heat out, right? Vent it. Isolate the fire. Well, here we have. Is this fire vented? I would think so, right? <laughs> it's venting. Watch the ridge line and watch where the ridge line intersects the tree line. Okay? By the way, this is a fully sprinklered building except for attic and probably the porches where I'm guessing this one started. There it is. See it? Now we're going to see the same event. This is the A side of the building. We'll see the same event from the C side of the building. And you get an idea of the magnitude of the event. <laughs> Much better from the C side. Oh, God. What do you think happened? I think there was a fire. Watch in oh, between really? the trees. I mean, what could have caused the fire? Oh, shit. All right. You didn't read about this one. This didn't make it on an IOSH report. This didn't make it on anybody's web page because the guys were prepared. They were all masked up, booted up, hooded up, collared up, gloved up. They had a charge line with them. What do you suppose triggered that event? What kind of ventilation? What brought that fire over to that location? Right? What, why did I send those guys up there with a pike pole and said, open up that ceiling remote from the fire? To do what? To cut it off, right? We've all done it. We've all cut off the fire. Well, if that attic is full of hot, thick, fuel-rich smoke, and I pull some ceiling and give it some fresh air without cooling that environment, what happens? That's what happens. All right? Sometimes it just lights up, but sometimes it goes boom, and that one went boom. All right? So what do we do different? How does this inform our decision-making on the fire ground? It makes no sense to talk about this if we can't change our decisions. What might you do different? You're, you're, the, you're the line boss. You're the guy up on that second floor doing what I told you to do. What do you do? How about this? One, two, what's action number three? Open up. Not when it lights up, not when you can see it. Not, no, open up. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna put a hole into a confined space that you think is full of fuel, get it wet. Because wet shit doesn't do that. Right? Cool that environment. Get it wet. Get it wet now. Everything, Bruno was great. God rest his soul. Everything dries. Nothing unburns. Get it wet. Here's another one, right? I hope you had a class on fire dynamics. I hope you had a class on reading smoke. I hope you, you thought about these sorts of things. But what do we really know about vent limited fires and what ventilation can and cannot do? Watch this video. This is an acquired structure in Bensonville, Illinois. It used to be 27 left at O'Hare Airport, but as they expanded the airport, we acquired part of Bensonville. There's a firewall in between the two occupancies right there. So this is a small townhome, two-story. Uh, only window, the only opening to the outside is that window you can see in the upper left. And we start a fire in this building. And this fire was started for ATF agents to come and do a post-fire analysis. This was for arson investigation. So there's clothes in the closet, pictures on the wall, all that kind of stuff. Fully furnished apartment. If you were to pull up on the scene right now, what do you have? Smoke coming out of the second floor, where's your fire? Just based on what you see. Second floor bedroom, right? If you pulled up at a different point in the fire's growth and development, though, you would have a different set of information. Where's your fire now? Right? Can you see the, the, the door, the front door? Did I stop it? I stopped yeah. it. That's all right. We'll get it to go again. This one's worth taking time with, okay? So what you're going to see is the fire's going to grow and develop, and then the fire dynamics are going to change dramatically without us touching a thing. 
And that's the lesson. And I won't point with the pointer because I risk hitting the clicker again. So the window on the second floor is open. Every other opening to this building is closed. Every, every door, every window is shut. It's a bit of a leaky structure, but most of them are. We start a fire. The clock isn't what's important because the size of the building, the amount of fire, the amount of furniture, its configuration, all that will change when things happen, but it won't necessarily change the dynamic. The dynamic would remain the same. So it's what you can see. And what do you see now? You see smoke coming from the second floor. Based on what you see, looks like you probably got a working fire there. You pull up a little bit later, you can start seeing smoke push out of the first floor door. All right, I got something on the first floor then, right? And is it, do I have an open interior stairway? Is that bedroom door to the hallway open? Is the bedroom door, the closed windows to the right, is that bedroom door open? Sure it is. You can see the smoke pushing out of there. But if you were to pull up at a different point in this fire's growth and development, you might get a very different read. Remember, we haven't touched anything. What if you pulled up now? Now what do you got? Nothing showing again, right? How did this happen? Who did what? Nobody did nothing. The fire ran out of air. Fire ran out of oxygen. When it runs out of oxygen, temperatures go down. When the temperatures go down, the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, it can't drive itself out the window anymore. That window actually sucked air for a few seconds when the fire started to put itself out. And when we opened up that door, what did we do to that fire condition? Made it worse, did we not? We started the clocking and we started to accelerate it again. Ventilation. This video demonstrates clearer than anything that ventilation in the absence of suppression is at best counterproductive. Right? You open up that door, you have a window of opportunity to get some water on the fire, life is good. You miss that opportunity, you've made conditions worse, not better. While you're wait, after you force that door, while you're waiting for your water, what do you do with that door? Close it. Control it, right? Don't stand there and look at your handiwork. Close the door, wait for the engine company to get ready, open it up again, go and put your fire out. Not rocket science. Here's another look at those uh, similar sort of set of conditions, right? What does this tell you? You open up the front door and it does this. This one loops, I hope, right? Uh, no. No? Okay. So look closely. It's only going to happen once. Unless I back up and try it again. That very clearly defined exchange of air, in this case you can see it because it's right there, but what if that fuel package was around the corner or up the stairs or down? What does that very clearly defined exchange of air tell you? The fire, the fire was vent limited. It's now getting the oxygen it needs. It's, you can see it pulling the oxygen in, and it's driving its heat out over your head and out the door. One, you're probably on the right level. This is good. This is a findable fire. What do you do? You follow the air track, right? <laughs> Takes you right to where the fire is. But it also tells you that the clock is ticking, and you're going to run out of time if you don't get there and do what you're supposed to do. You don't have all day. You need to start moving. And if you're not ready to move, if somebody's having a mask malfunction behind you, you need to control that door until you can get everything squared away and then get back in. Don't be sitting there with that door opening, let, letting that fire get fed. Make sense? I hope so. Okay. You can learn a whole lot from reading that smoke and reading that neutral point. Want to jump on this? Because I'm not familiar with this one. It just, it's just a demonstration. The, the video is just it's a demonstration of a good neutral plane. Uh, you have a bi-directional flow right there at the window. So that window is acting as an inlet and an outlet. Uh, if you had a unidirectional flow at that window, meaning that it's simply, or it's simply acting as an exhaust, what is that giving you an indication of? That you have another opening somewhere in that structure, right? It's getting its air from somewhere else. So it's just it's a, it's a nice... Bit of video just and, and likely lower than, than what you're seeing come out, right? Likely. Think about a Weber grill. Right? You got a good low opening and a good high opening that's going to all exhaust on the higher opening. This is you. Yeah. Well, just, I just let him go when he's on a roll. So. All right. So I talked about you never want to be inside the fire, you know, in a compartment, in a fire building, whatever, and getting uncomfortably hot and not be in the middle of performing some critical fire ground function because now you're just becoming a liability to the rest of the firefighters on the fire ground, all right? Similarly, you never want to be between where that fire is and where it needs to go. You never want to just be in that flow path without the ability to do something about it. You got to understand that the condition is not going to get better and taking more windows is not going to release more heat. It's going to feed more fire. Every last one of these guys in these pictures had a door behind them that they could have closed when they entered the room they were in. But they didn't need to, so they didn't do it. 
I'm searching this bedroom. Everything's fine. I'm just going to search this bedroom. Oh, shit, something changed. Something's wrong. I can't get back to the door. What do I do? I go to the window. We give guys bailout bags, and we give them hooks, and we practice all this kind of dramatic stuff, and that's all wonderful that we teach ourselves how to do that. Let's teach ourselves to close the door behind us all the time. Give me a reason when it wouldn't make sense to close the door behind you when you go in to search your room. If you're searching the room from the outside, if you're going to vent, enter, search, what do you do as soon as you get in the room? What if you've got to crawl over the baby to get to the door? You close the door, right, because you recognize that conditions, you vented this, well, come on, if you're doing it from the inside, how does that change? Get inside, close the door. What do we teach, guys? Who's got the camera? The officer? And what does the firefighter do? Perimeter search. Really? Have we got time for this shit? I'm serious. That's going to take forever. Oh, I'm watching you. I'm guiding you. How about we both get in, close the door behind us, and take that window? Then in their search, done opposite. Now I can see. Now I can get up off my knees. Now I can search that room in seconds, not minutes, and get on to the next room. Control the door. Control the airflow. Control the flow path. Start having these discussions about when it's appropriate. Understanding flow path also helps us understand that more ventilation isn't necessarily better. If I have a two-story atrium, this could be, we can use this in a lot of different ways, but if I have a two-story great room and a fire in a kitchen and that fire is up and impinging on that high window and venting out that high window, what happens to conditions on the floor when I take the sliding glass door? What have I done? I've brought the hot gas layer down. Have I made conditions for the victims better or worse? Possibly worse, right? More is not automatically better. Understand the complexities of ventilation and flow paths and how they impact the fire ground. You'll make better decisions for yourself. So this is just a, a, a quick example. Um, can we write in our SOPs, you will never operate in a flow path? No, we can't. We have the best intention, but the goal of the research is to give us the education that we can, one, identify that the flow path is there, two, it starts to educate us how we can manipulate that flow path. Can we start to reduce the severity of the flow path? Can we redirect that flow path? Because there are times we're just going to have to operate in that flow path, but we have to recognize that it's there. If we take this incident and we had a fire in this back corner, uh, it may, there may be an open window or it may auto vent. What is that window acting as? An exhaust. But as we just saw with that recent video, what's it also acting as? As an inlet. So if you had this scenario, you pull up, you have fire in that back corner on the C DC side. Um, as Pete will say, you have an eight foot wall with a firefighter eating dog in the opposite side of that wall. So you can't simply go around it and put an exterior hand line in. Or topography may limit your ability to go to the side and use an exterior hand line. So your only other option is to do what? Go through that front door. But when you open that front door and you start to advance that hand line, hopefully a charged hand line, what are you also creating? An additional outlet, exactly. You're creating that flow path. And we just have to recognize that, right? We have to be prepared to cool those gases as we move forward, cool that environment as we move forward. Watch for conditions or sense conditions that may deteriorate very rapidly. Go ahead. I, I, I had an, an epiphany. I had an epiphany taking a class actually on electrical hazards, you know, high voltage stuff. And the, the guy was giving a class and he says, okay, so, um, you know, electricity follows the path of least resistance to ground, right? Everybody, yeah, 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 okay. So I got a grounded 13,000 volt, you know, high, high tension wire in the, in the alley or whatever, and you become an alternate path to ground. Are you gonna get, are you gonna get electrocuted? It's grounded. And the answer is yes because there's always enough left for you. Most of it might take the path to least resistance, but at 13,000 volts, there's always enough left for you if you become an alternate path. Ventilation and fire growth is a similar thing nowadays. There is so much fuel in our environment that every time we add that air, every time we create another path, most of it might want to go right out that bedroom window, but there's enough left over for us. And we can't lose sight of that. At Herbie Johnson's fire, that attic fire that he died in was ventilated. Well ventilated. But when more air was let into that enclosed stairwell on the back of that building, the unburned fuel in that stairwell leaned out and blew up and blew that door down 
And there was Herbie not ready for it. And that's simply how he died. It was ventilated, but nobody was getting any water on it. That was what they were going to do, right? But it, timing didn't work out for them. Fire flows from high pressure to low pressure, always. Up, down, sideways. High pressure goes to low pressure. There's no magic if I vent high, the world is good. If you vent high and low or you vent behind that hose line, it's coming your way. It's always going to go to the low pressure zone. I probably can't get you tough guy firefighters. I know I wouldn't tactically, or I wouldn't manage the flow path. I can't talk to guys about managing the air track, but I can get them to tactically ventilate. I can, I can make it out of aluminum and paint it black. Seriously. What does tactical mean? And this is what we really want you to do is tactically ventilate. It means controlled, communicated, understood, right? Not just more is better or faster is better. It's got to be controlled. It's got to be communicated. It's got to be tactical, intentional, done right. When it's not done right, bad things happen. This is an old piece of film, but this is nothing new. I could name you 10 fires in the last 10 years that look just like this one. Got fire in the back of the building. We're adding ventilation to the C side, or the B side rather. Even worse, we're ventilating right here behind the hose, hose line that's going inside the front door. Are we putting any water on this fire yet? And yet we're adding the ventilation. And when this happens, that should not surprise anybody. That's what you should expect to do. You created a low pressure zone. You gave that fire a path to come to the front of the building and you weren't suppressing that fire. This is what's gonna happen. And you know, Pete, the, the research is telling us we have options, right? On that fire, did you see a couple options there? If you want to go through that front door, what are one of the actions that we don't want to see happen if, you're if that's your chosen tactic? Taking all those windows, Don't right? take the windows and control the door behind you. Who should call for the extra ventilation? Let's do it right now. You're, the, you're at this fire. Who calls for those windows to be taken? Who? The guy inside, the host team, the engine boss, whatever you call them, right? Not, not some freelance and trucking, not some incident commander, that, whatever, that's, you know what I mean. But seriously, that's the guy, the guy that's inside, the guy that knows we're about to put water on this fire or we are putting water on this fire, give us some ventilation. That's how it should work. Not somebody that thinks they know what they're doing, right? That's what coordinated would be. Every time you force that front door, it's, it's ventilation. And ventilation always leads to fire growth, period. I was taught this 40 years ago when I first came on the job, but I didn't understand it as well as I understand it today. Because what's really important is to understand that that door, it's not just the size of the opening, it's the orientation of that opening. That door is much more, can't get this to advance, brothers. There we go. Whoops. No, that was me. Sorry, guys. All right, here we go. Leave the clicker alone. That door, its orientation is critically important, and you're going to see that here. When you change that orientation, you not only increase the amount of ventilation up high, more importantly, you increase the very efficient air entrainment coming in low. That door is critically important. And what we're going to see in this video is a small one-room fire with a guy at the front door. Can you get in there and close that door? Sure you could. And if you couldn't get in there to close that door, could you close the apartment door while you're waiting for the line? Sure you could. But in this case, that doesn't happen. So what happens? In less than 40 seconds, that one room fire transitions to flashover in, in the entire apartment. And then it starts to fail the windows. And even now, if we would close that front door, can you see the air entrainment in the bottom of the door? Every once in a while, it gets down low enough. You see it right there. You see the air getting sucked in really low. If we could just pull that door shut, we would slow this whole process down. And that's what we need to learn how to do, right? Control the air. Think about this. You learned this on day one, and then you forgot all about it. If you haven't got the water, what do you got control over? Maybe you can get the fuel out, go in and grab the couch and throw it out the window, but probably better option is to control the air. Control the air until you can get effective water on the fire. When you control the door, you limit the size of the fire, and you can more aggressively move through the building. Once you start putting water on the fire, open up, open up, open up, have at it. That doesn't change. But let's slow down the ventilation until we have some effective suppression. 
And how you do that in your little corner of the world is stuff that you can figure out better than I can. It's the principle that's important. Let's not let our ventilation get ahead of our suppression. I know it doesn't happen in your fire department. It certainly doesn't happen in my fire department. But when you get on YouTube and you fire up some of that fire porn, everybody else is doing it. So maybe, just maybe, you and I need to take another look at our own fire ground and see if sometimes we might let our get a ventilation get ahead of our suppression, right? And this is all we're talking about. We're not nailing doors shut. We're not, we're not blocking off our means of egress. After all, there's a hose line going through that door. We should be able to find our way out. We're just trying to get you the con concept of managing the air that's coming into the building until you can get effective water on the fire. And how that manifests itself on your fire ground is up to you. And yes, that will change. And that will be different depending on manning equipment and all that other stuff. But if you had the principle ground into your firefighters' heads, they'll make good decisions on the fire ground. When I finally stopped telling my guys how to do it and just told them what I wanted done, they figured it out a whole lot better than I ever could. Give them the tools, give them the equipment, give them the knowledge and trust them to make good decisions. They'll do it for you. Have we said this often enough? Venting doesn't automatically equal cooling. I mean, the physics just argue against it. 10% of that 21% oxygen in air grows the fire faster than your opening can let it out. And your opening, you can make your opening bigger, but more doesn't come out unless and until more is coming in. That's physics, at least in this universe. The ones that the millennials occupy, that universe might be a little different. But our universe says that when you let smoke and hot gases out, the oxygen you let in grows the fire faster than you can exhaust that heat. So you have to suppress. Don't ventilate without suppression. Here's another example, another one that you didn't see, that you didn't hear about because the guys were wearing their gear. First company in on the scene is a rescue unit. In this part of the world, that's an that's a ambulance with two fully firefighter trained firefighters on it, right? Cross-trained firefighter paramedics. With the permission of the incident commander, they go in to do a primary search ahead of the hose line because the engine crew's right on the scene, right behind them, and they were not reports of people trapped, but told that people were usually home this time of day. Fair enough. In they go. The engine crew drops their hose into this porch on the front of the house and charges it. 100 feet of hose inside that porch, charged. Yeah, right? It happens. Happens to you. Happens to me. What's the condition of the door? Those guys went inside to search the building. They had a couch on fire right inside the front door. A couch. That's all it was. They identified it as a couch. They could see it. They could see that that's all they had. They go right past the couch back to the bedrooms. What's the condition of the door? It's open. And now the line gets charged, and there's no water to put on the fire. And then... Some firefighter that was trained that ventilation equals cooling sees this sliding glass door here, and he sees the fire growing behind the door. So what does he do? Takes that glass. And then what happens? From entry to flash over the entire first floor is two minutes. And two guys come running out on fire. Not hot, not smoking, on fire. They had to pick up the burnt hose line to put them out. That was some of the radio traffic. Somebody pick up that hose line and put these guys out. That's what they did. Picked it up, squeezed the end of the hose line like a garden hose, and put those guys out. And they survived because they were wearing their gear and wearing it properly. So let's just pause here. How do we do this different? Let me take away all the low-hanging fruit. Right? Never mind the 360, never mind the two in and two out. Never, no, it's not, I think there's somebody home. It's dad outside on the front lawn, all snotted up, telling you his two boys are inside that house. And he tells you exactly where they're at. Are you going to go get them? Or are you going to wait for your hose line? What are you going to do? You're going to go get them. So let's go get them and prevent this from happening. What do we do different? Well, first off, do you guys carry hand cans on your fire apparatus? Are they welded to the fire apparatus? With the frequency that they show up on the fire ground, you would think they were. My tool assignment as a rookie firefighter was, was sledgehammer, hand can, pick head axe, and pike pole. And it wasn't a punishment detail. The next guy up in the pecking order was Jeff Parrots, and his tool assignment was Halligan bar, hand can, pick head axe, and pike pole. And if either one of us was off on a Kelly day, Charlie would pick it up, and Charlie had 15 years on the job. We took 10 gallons of water and forcible entry tools everywhere we went. And if the engine was delayed, or if the engine, if the engine would have had a long lead out or we thought there was going to be a problem with the engine getting water, we would take their can-can too. I'm talking about a truck company bringing 15 gallons of water with us everywhere we went for exactly this purpose. Get inside. I can start putting water on the fire. I can start putting water on the fire. 
It's a couch. Right? You can go get the kids. And we close the door behind us, right? Deny it air, early water. What do you do when you locate the kids? His boys, his kids are two 15-year-olds, twins, 160 pounds apiece. Now what? They're in the bedroom. What do you do? Let's talk this out. Close the door. Open the window. You see what I'm getting at? What are you likely to do? What is that rookie firefighter that's about to make his first grab? And rookie firefighter could be a guy with seven or eight years on the job. Finally about to make his first grab. When he finds those kids, what is he instinctively going to do? Going to drag them back out the way they came because that's what we always taught him to do in training. For reasons that had nothing to do with effective search techniques. Think about that because it really is going to happen. It really is going to happen that way. And it doesn't have to. If the FDNY can get that aircraft carrier of a fire department to change direction, there's hope for all of us. So this is the OV, or OVM. This is the outside vent. And he's on a fire escape. You can barely see him in this video. But he's on that fire escape, and he sees fire behind that window with the air conditioner. But he doesn't take that window. Because why? Because he's trying to communicate with that engine officer first, and he's, he's calling that engine officer and asking permission to take the, take the window. And you see that he almost does it, and then he stops because the communication wasn't clear. And once the communication is clear, he takes that window, and life is good. And that's what we want to see happening. Taking that window before they're getting effective water on that fire is only going to grow that fire. It'll look really good, right? Because here's what happens, right? This is because of how we explain things. We say you take the window to let the fire out. As if there were 15 buckets of fire that were going to come hopping out the window when you opened it up. That's not how it works, right? There's a, a virtually unlimited amount of fuel in that box. And when we open up, we're letting air in, and that's growing that fire, and yes, that fire then comes out. But there's not some fixed amount of fire that we let out by opening up more windows. It doesn't work that way. And if we think it works that way, we got some learning to do. Right? Vent when you got water. Here's what happens when you don't. Okay? First floor, the engine's right there with the truck. We've got a ventilate. Can you imagine somebody saying, unventilate the building? Uh, Chief, you're breaking up. But that's exactly what they should be doing. Instead of taking windows, they should be closing that door. They're not in a position to put water on the fire, so what can we do? We can deny it air. Deny it the air it needs to grow until we can get water on the fire. And then by all means, if you're the officer, get in there and get your helmet all salt. I mean, investigate fire conditions. Right? Stir the fuel up a little bit. I mean, it's real easy, and I apologize to whoever this, these guys were. It's, you know, hundreds and thousands of video clips like this we could pick. We're not picking on these guys in particular. One of these days, one of these guys is going to be in the class. Uh, he, he already was. <laughs> I've talked to him, believe me. And I am a big advocate of door control, but I don't advocate you do it with your body. Okay? What's that guy doing? He's heating up his gear. There's another guy still inside that building. There's a second guy comes out behind him. Right? Nobody got hurt, so this is okay. This is not okay. This is rolling the dice. And what really scares me about this particular video clip, and this is why I picked this one, is because when they finally do get water on the fire, watch how fast this thing goes out. I mean, it looks like they, that they got three floors of fire now, right? But really, it's mostly just the fire gases making a big light show on the outside of the building. Once they get effective water on that fire, the vinyl siding really does self-extinguish. The hot gases coming out the second floor aren't so hot anymore, so they don't light off when they're coming out the window. There was no fire on the second floor. It was just fuel-rich smoke. It all goes away. Fire went out, nobody got hurt. Don't give me that UL bullshit. Aggressive interior attack is the way to put fires out. Really? I mean, seriously, you could walk away from this saying this is the right way to do things. But let me ask you this. Did everything get better from the moment they got on the scene? Okay. Fire went out, nobody got hurt, is way down here. I could be three sheets to the wind and accomplish that. Everything got better from the moment we got on the scene is impossibly high, but that's where the bar belongs. As professional firefighters, that's where the bar belongs, that high. Every action you take on the fire ground should improve conditions, not make them worse first. And clearly that's what happened there. And clearly they had, they had some options that they could have exercised that would have prevented all that from happening. And the fire still would have went out, and nobody would have gotten hurt, and less damage would have been done. Fair enough? Yes? Yeah, yeah I want to go through this part real quickly. Sure. Yeah, we, we're, we got pressed on time, so we're, we're, 
we will leave time for questions. Uh, so we're going to go through a couple of things kind of quickly. And uh, again, th this, it'll be uh, available for download. Uh, one of the things we talk about are, are basement fires. We know how basement fires or below grade fires are extremely dangerous. And so we could pull up Cherry Road. We could pull up the Diamond Heights fire. We could pull up so many fires across the country where our firefighters lost their lives. And we're looking at the best tactics. But when we came on a number of years ago, when I came on, we did this at times. When you're going to search a, a multifamily apartment, you know, the officer would say, keep the fire at bay. Keep the fire at bay. Don't let the fire come up the steps. We're going to do a quick search. But as we apply water to those top of the steps, are we really improving conditions? And if you look at the, the temperature readings that were taken, conditions are still continuing to deteriorate in that basement. Right? In fact, it's eaten away at that combustible work platform that you're operating on, that floor system that you're operating on. Maybe, maybe if instead of going up through those steps and finding our way down the basement steps to start putting water on the fire, maybe as we're moving forward, we start to put water on the fire. We start to improve conditions. And whoa, Pete, you know, we're, we're, we're making, yeah, oh my gosh. We pushed fire throughout that structure but we're diminishing the role of the US Fire Service by advocating this because this is defensive operation. But is it? Which way is this crew moving? They're moving forward, right? Are they still gonna have to go up those steps to the interior stairway? Are they still gonna have to make their way to the basement to complete extinguishment? Absolutely. Did they reduce the risk? I didn't say eliminate. Did they reduce the risk that that company is encountering as they start to complete extinguishment? Yeah, if they don't do anything else, Further than that, will the fire come back? Sure it will, right? Did it improve conditions for that occupant or those occupants throughout the structure? We took temperatures from 1,200 degrees to 400 degrees, 1,700 degrees to 300 degrees. Outside of your operational environment of your PPE to that operational environment of the PPE. You, so that, you know, we deliberately kept those guys outside, but that, that whole process, the actual knockdown, took about 20, 30 seconds tops, right? So once you, once you do that and then you transition back in, think about how much faster you can move to your objective when you drop these temperatures. And remember, when we were at the top of the stairs, raining water down inside those stairs, we took the temperatures from 600 to 400. That's great. When we did it from the flower pots, we took them from 600 to 200. Right? More. We took temperatures in the basement and dropped them to the floor. You can be that much more aggressive once you make your entry when you've improved that environment for yourselves and for all the victims, right? We're not, you see what we're getting at, I hope. And, and more importantly, right at the top of the steps, Pete, when we were flowing water there at the top of the steps, we reduced the energy production down to seven kilowatt hours per minute meter squared, right? Here, zero, zero kilowatt hours of energy that's being produced. There's nothing coming up the stairs now. I can walk down the stairs. I don't have to fight my way down the stairs. So okay. real quick, I'm going to move. I, I'm going to play the next video again. It's to give you kind of a scope. We're talking about water moving air or air or water moving fire. Right? We're going to cut the video a little short just uh, because it's going to repeat something you already saw. But this is in Delaware County, which is right outside of the Philadelphia airport. Steve's dad actually manages this facility. It's an emergency services facility. So it has a shooting range. It also has a tactical shooting range. Heck, if they put a Dunkin' Donuts on site, it was like cop heaven. But you can see the scope of what we do with the research projects. My name is Robin Zavotek with the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. We're here at the Delaware County Emergency Services Training Center testing airflow entrainment in nozzles. My name is Jerry Knapp. I'm a training officer in Rockland County, New York Fire Training Center. Uh, this nozzle testing that UL is doing is, is very important. Uh, we know house fires are controlled by the amount of air that, that's, uh, that's allowed in the house. Uh, what we don't know is what our fire streams are doing to that air entrainment. Are they pushing a lot of air in or what are, what are they doing to the fire? Uh, so this uh, measuring the airflow caused by nozzles uh, will be a major part of uh, uh, learning how we control house fires in the future. Our tests today are looking at how the different nozzle patterns, the different types of nozzles, and the different uh, application techniques are going to move either more or less air.
I'm Keith Stakes. Are we so we're going to cut Keith right there because you're, you saw him earlier. Um, so this is where the technical panel comes into play here. As we're looking at the fire attack study, each technical panel was required. Each technical panel member was required to submit a video of how they advance a handline in their respective department. So you had firefighters that were opening up the hand line, shutting it down, then advancing. You had firefighters that were advancing the hose line as it was flowing. You had firefighters using straight stream, using narrow fog stream. So we, we some used the zero O pattern, some used the Z pattern, some whitewash back and forth. We wanted to start to measure what's the impact? What are you, what are you moving? What kind of error are you moving when you use these different tactics? And we started to measure this. And you start to see here with the straight stream, uh, at 150 gallons per minute, you can see the amount of air that you're in training. With the straight stream, just under 2,000 uh, cubic feet, cubic meters per minute, you're moving of air. When you start to advance it a little bit further, you see with the narrow fog stream, you're moving almost 10,000 cubic feet per minute. Per minute. So uh, more importantly, as you started to move that pattern around, you saw how much more air you're in training. Uh, if you look at that narrow fog, Simply by going into an O pattern, you're moving almost 15,000 cubic feet of air per minute. Now let's compare that to a positive pressure fan. If I utilize a positive pressure fan, because we did that study on positive pressure attack, and I have a one-to-one -one exhaust from the intake to the outlet, remember that intake is the interior door to the fire room, not your exterior door. But if I have a one-to-one -one outlet, meaning I have one window open to that door, I'm moving about 8,600 cubic feet per minute. If I create a two to one exhaust, which we would prefer to see, two windows open with that interior door open, I'm moving about 14,000 gallon or cubic feet per minute. But with that narrow fog stream with an O pattern, I'm moving over 15,000 cubic feet per minute. I'm moving more air by simply moving that narrow fog around in a circular pattern than I am by using a positive pressure fan. That's a significant amount of air. And we start to think about the impact on the fire growth and the movement of fire throughout the, throughout the structure. So we really saw that uh, all of this was consistent regardless of the manufacturer, but we saw the entrainment increases every time we started to move that, that hand line. So I'm gonna kind of go through this real quickly so we can get to it. Uh, we really wanted to look at this study uh, some of the, you know, would the f exterior fire attack push fire? Will it harm the victims? I showed you the, the, the test that we were doing. We had the victims located throughout the structure. We were measuring their exposure to the thermal risk. We were also measuring their exposure to contaminants. You know, what was in the air, hydrogen cyanide, uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, we were looking at, you know, are we creating a steam effect on these occupants with the various tactics? We used transitional attack, where we used a solid stream from the exterior and put it through the window and started to knock the body of the fire down. We wanted to measure how well it performed, right? And what was the effect? Did it push these thermal effects throughout the structure? We used an interior advance. So we had that window open, you pop that front door, you wait about five seconds, make sure that that is stabilized before you make entry. And then you can see as they make entry, it takes a bit of time for them to advance that hand line down the hallway in order to complete extinguishment. One thing we did learn from this, uh, Keith Stakes and Mike Alt were continuously on the tip. They got better and more efficient after each evolution. So this type of training improved your performance. There's value to that. That was a side lesson that we learned from it. But you see, you know, an interior attack takes some time. Right? It may be the most appropriate depending on where the fire is located at, but we're looking, you know, the research is telling us we have options here. So we've talked about transitional attack, and I'm going to kind of vote to that. We've talked about transitional attack, and a lot of people get hung up on transitional attack and the labeling of it. You know, well, transition, you can transition from offensive to defensive, and you really want to pick apart the, 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 the wording of it. Personally, I really don't care what they call it. Softening the target? No. Transitional Schizo attack? Schizophrenic attack. That's what it's got to be. Schizophrenic attack, right? We just want you to understand that you have this option in your tool belt. That, you know, you use what's most, of, what's most applicable at that point in time based on the conditions that are being presented to you. You want to take this scenario? Sure. 
So I'm going I'm to back it up just a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, so for me, going through this research, being involved in it for the last dozen years or so, the, this whole idea of quick water or transitional attack was not news to me because in 1983, City of Chicago Fire Department instituted quick water attack, put deck guns and crosslays and pre-connects and large diameter hose on our apparatus for the first time in 1983 and gave guys permission to hit the fire from the outside. You pull up and go, oh shit. Okay, pull it up, let the house wreckers have the front of the building, lead out the cross lay, put out the rest of the fire. Been doing it for 30 years, it's not news to me, but it's news to a lot of the American Fire Service. So fine, I wasn't there on naming day. If I was, I would have picked quick water. Fire gases are coming out the window, which means the invisible ones, i.e. the steam, is coming out as well. But that changes his flow. All right, watch what he does now, and then watch the top of the window. Right? Completely changes the flow of gases. It's not coming out the window anymore. Where's it going? High pressure's going to low pressure. He created a high pressure zone. He essentially turned on the fan at that window. And if you're the guy in the hallway, when he does that, you're going to notice it. But as long as he keeps it tight and he's driving it off the ceiling, life is going to be good. This is anecdotal evidence. This is a little bit of fire ground footage that we can or cannot make a big deal of, depending on which side of the fence we're on. What's nice about the research is we can test this. And this is what we're watching in this one. We're going to test this. We're going to see if it's repeatable. We're going to try to understand it better. We're going to measure the outcomes. So we're in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and we got an acquired structure, and there's a fire in both of the rooms on the second floor. That's what you're seeing on the upper left, the exterior view. Upper right is the thermal imaging view. Lower left and lower right are the interior stairwell. We've got two rooms of fire. So we take one firefighter, we give him a line with a straight stream on it, we say, stop here, put water on the fire. That's all he's told to do. Stop here and put water on the fire. He does. Look at the top of the stairs. Look for the collapse of the thermal layer. Look for the steam cloud. Look for the fireball. You'd be the first guy to see it, right? It's not happening. So that's great. We put out or at least knocked back one room of fire. Problem is we got another room of fire. Good news is we got another firefighter with another line. He's given a fog line. He's told to stop here, put water on the fire. That's what he's going to do. Watch the top of the stairs. Right? It had nothing to do with where you were standing when you opened up your nozzle. It had everything to do with your stream selection and understanding fire dynamics and flow paths. So here's the money shot. Here's where you came for. Right? Pay attention now. Don't do this. Do this. Any truckies in the room? I'll say it really slow for you. <laughs> Don't do this. You remember, first seven years I, on the truck, remember that. Do this, right? You see what we're getting at? If we can understand what really happens, we can make better decisions on the fire ground. And we can get rid of the myths of, you can't do this because people will die. Not if you do it right. Fastest water on the fire is the best water on the fire. I can tell you that from 30 years of experience, not from a couple of research burns. From 30 years of my experience, the fastest water on the fire is the best water on the fire. So we wanted to show it visually, right? So we went to an urban fire department nice. that operates very similar to many of us across the country. And typically how Milwaukee would operate is you have a fire in this uh, colonial uh, and they'll go through the front door and extinguish this fire room by room by room. Is that wrong? No, right? We do it a thousand times across the country. Are we saying it's wrong? No, not at all. But what we asked Milwaukee to do is that, you know what, take an alternative path here. What we want you to do is go down the side of this structure and just put the fire out, enough water to put the fire out in that room and advance down the side of the structure, right? And see, see, if, that, see if that works, see it's, if it's successful. Here in the video, we even have the occupant running out, pressuring that officer. You can see the officer comes around and he's tempted to fall back into, right? Start popping doors, start popping windows. He does his 360 or gets eyes on each side of the building. He goes to open the door. And I think this is when Steve yelled at him, leave that door alone. That's the truck's job. So they're gonna lay it out. They're gonna get their water. And you're gonna see it here as soon as Julie gets her head out of the way but the truck company is gonna show up and we asked them, don't pop that door until the engine company is ready to make entry. Yeah, it's important to note that, that they're simulating a difficult forcible entry yeah, scenario. Clearly this one would have been one, two and they're yeah. in. 
We're not letting them in. That's not okay. the famous Milwaukee chop, the dink, right. dink, dink. No, no offense to any Milwaukee folks, you know. All right. So if you got we asked them not to go quickly. Yeah. You got this forcible entry challenge. What should you be doing now that you have this charge line? You should be putting water on the fire. So as they, right here, as Pete was saying, we just asked them to knock down the body of fire in that room, advance down. So it's five seconds, four seconds, two seconds, three seconds. And then the combustible exterior, they're going to have to knock down. And then they'll transition to the interior. So you see that here? And... Are they going to have to go inside to complete extinguishment? Absolutely. Again, we're just trying to demonstrate that, that, that there are options here. So were they successful? Four seconds of water, two seconds of water, three seconds of water, five seconds of water to transition to the interior. One minute and 10 seconds, 14 seconds of flow, 35 gallons of water. They used 35 gallons of water. Did they achieve success? In the living room, temperatures went from 600 degrees to 200 degrees. In the kitchen, Temperatures went from 1,300 degrees to 300 degrees. So outside of our operational environment, down into our operational environment. And then there was that open bedroom. No water was flown in the bedroom at all. 500 degrees to 200 degrees, right? So the researchers are saying we have options here, right? We can't always operate strictly like, oh, this is what I have to do. I have to go through the front door every single time. The goal of the research is to educate our firefighters and our officers so they can make informed decisions on the fire ground based on the conditions that are in front of them. The challenge is, can we do that? A group of scientists placed five monkeys in a cage and in the middle a ladder with bananas on top. Every time a monkey went up the ladder, the scientists soaked the rest of the monkeys with cold water. After a while, every time a monkey went up the ladder, the others beat up the one on the ladder. After some time, no monkey dare go up the ladder, regardless of the temptation. Scientists then decided to substitute one of the monkeys. The first thing this new monkey did was go up the ladder. Immediately, the other monkeys beat him up. After several beatings, the new member learned not to climb the ladder, even though he never knew why. A second monkey was substituted, and the same occurred. The first monkey participated on the beating for the second monkey. The replacements repeated until what was left was a group of five monkeys that, even though never received a cold shower, continued to beat up any monkey who attempted to climb the ladder. If you asked the new group of monkeys why the beatings took place, the answer would probably be, Well, I don't know. That's just how things are done around here. That's the way we've always done it, right? First of all, I want, to, I want to assure everybody, animal rights activists, no monkeys were harmed in the fit making of this video, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so if I were to, you know, it, this is really important, right? And by the way, the more you laughed, the more change you probably have to institute in your organization. Um, but, but this is really important. So if I were to ask my dad or my dad's generation this question, you know, why did you vent as you go? Does, was anybody in this room ever taught, as you're moving through a building, you search, you come to a window, take the window? You're getting a few nods, right? If I were to ask, and I was taught that, and I in turn taught that to other firefighters, okay? Sean's right, I did come on the job 60 years ago, 40. The point is, if I were to ask my dad's generation, why'd you do that, what do you suppose they would tell me? None of, none of this nonsense about let the heat out or lift the thing or save lives, they'd say, you take the window, you stick your head out, you take a couple of breaths of fresh air, and you continue your search. They did it because they had to. They had no options. It was do that or leave. We have options. If the fire's over here, do you vent the roof over here? Why not? You're going to draw the fire to that location. If the fire's in the kitchen and you're searching the second floor, why take that window? You're going to draw the fire to that location, as assuredly as you would if you vented the roof in the wrong location. We don't need to stick our head out the window and take a couple of breaths of fresh air, so perhaps there are times when we don't need to be taking those windows. Let's start having those kinds of discussions. Ask why and try to figure out what the best answer is. At fires, at times, I would walk up to some of my officers, and as an incident commander, battalion chief, I'd, I'd simply ask them, why'd you, why'd you go through the front door? Why'd you go through the D side? I went to the D side chief, the fire was in this back kitchen. We were able to come down, hit it really quick from the outside, transition in and complete extinction. Great. 
Was I questioning their decisions? No, I wanted to, under, I wanted to make sure they, they were having a thought process, that they were going through a process and making decisions based on the conditions that were presenting to them. I wanted to understand why they did it, why they made that decision. And there's been a lot of discussion on the research, right? Good, bad, you know, Steve Welcome's discussion. Discussions challenge us, right? We don't have all the answers. We want the input. But I had one firefighter come up and say, oh, there's the guy that's killed the American Fire Service. And I really went up to say hi to him at the Cleveland Indians were in first place in September, and I was really excited, right? And I said, first of all, you're giving this guy way too much credit here. But I want to understand, what do you mean by killing the fire service? You're killing our culture. Really? So I went up and I looked at the definition of culture, and it's a way of thinking, behaving, or working that exists in a place or an organization. And I thought about it, and I said, you know what? Damn, he's right. We are trying to change our culture, our way of thinking, our way of behaving or working. What no one at FSRI is trying to change or anyone that supports FSRI or anybody involved with it, we're not trying to change our values. I'm not trying to change why you're willing to risk your life for people you've never met. I'm not questioning or challenging or wanting to change why you're willing to take a, a career that's going to take years off your life, right? No one's questioning that, no one wants to change that. What we want to do is we want to bring the education of the research so that you can make informed decisions on the fire ground so you can go and enjoy that retirement that this union is working so hard to secure. I've lost way too many friends. Jimmy Marlowe, two years. Tommy Huff, not even two years. We have to change how we think and how we approach our careers. This is our responsibility. This is the career that we chose. It's our responsibility to understand the basics of our career. And that's understanding the basics of fire, the basics of building construction, and how all these interplay with our, our decisions on the fire ground. Because if we don't, we're going to continue to still operate in the same mode and still put our firefighters at risk needlessly. I'll talk over this a little bit because we don't really have to hear the reporter. But you'll see an overhead view here in a second. As the company pulls up, you'll see fire showing from the A side and the B side. Morning is taking what they can find amid all the debris. This is the aftermath. But look at the scene just before noon. This is what firefighters responded to: a small house on fire, no one, in, no one inside, rather, at the time where the fire had been smoldering for a while. When it erupted, flames shot through the roof. A firefighter from the Houston Fire Department with a protective suit and air pack was the first to go through the door, but then there was trouble. And the door closed behind him, left him in there. So the other guys immediately opened the door, pulled him out because he was taking some heat, and then they went in and finished the students in the fire. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to criticize, uh, you know, anybody for not throwing the crew under the bus, right? But what do we teach our firefighters as they advance a uh, hand line down a hallway? Don't pass fire, right? Knock that fire down before you keep advancing because you don't want the fire to grow behind you. Why is that any different when the fire is on the exterior showing itself? Why are we bypassing fire and then make an entry without the hand line, right? It's just a simple way of how we approach this, how we, make our, how we develop our decision making and understanding the physics of what we're talking about here. Don't let ventilation get ahead of suppression, right? Put water on the fire as quickly as possible. You improve conditions for your companies that are making that entry, but you're also improving conditions for those occupants that you're trying to save, that you took an oath to save. And to fulfill that oath, you have to understand your job. You have to understand the basics of your job and the sciences of your job. We can change, right? We've changed in Cleveland. We've, we've seen change in FDNY. We've seen change in LA and LA County and Chicago and giving our officers or empowering our officers to make decisions on the conditions that are in front of them and not scripting their response as a cookie cutter response to every single fire they encounter. But that's the challenge we have. We appreciate it. Uh, there is a couple, there are a few more slides that you can get on the download. Uh, I really encourage you. I'm gonna kind of advance real quickly because we, we wanna show you uh, the resources. These are all the research projects we've been conducting at FSRI. We currently have more than what we know what to do with, right? But all of this, all of this is absolutely free to you at ulfirefightersafety.org. 
every report from every research project is there in its entirety. Uh, we've had educational projects or educational modules developed for all of these, and they're all free for you. In Cleveland, we, we have quarterly Con Ed. We had our members go through this online program, start to educate them, right? You can get on social media and get hit with updates. You know, where are the crews burning now? Where are the acquired structures? Uh, the call for the technical panel on search and rescue is going out this week. So go to the, search, to the social media, sign up for it, and put in for one of these technical panels because we'd really like to see you participate. So at that point, we're going to open it up for questions. Okay. Uh, we have probably about 15 minutes. We have microphone here, and we encourage you to, you know, go ahead. You had a question? Somebody. I didn't have time for the plant. But uh, if you don't have a question, I'm going to turn Pete loose again. Yeah, be careful. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can you use the microphone? Cause, yeah. um, just because uh, those that are, are in on the live it? stream. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear Good. you. Okay, I don't really have a question. It's more of a comment. You, you, you know, you showed, you showed the the fire in Houston, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not from Houston, but that that incident occurred. I want to say it was Easter 2009. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know the exact year. W w where yeah. was the host line? Which it, which one now? The, the which one yeah, the which one? There were two, two from, from Houston. Houston there. The wind-driven fire from Houston, the big ranch. Okay, they, oh, had, they had two lines through the front door when the event occurred. And, they, and, and the two, the, the line of duty desks, and this is where I'm kind of going with my thing, right. is the line of duty desks there, they got separated from their hose line. Right. How many, and, and I agree with the flow path and all that, I mean, and, and it's kind of like you alluded to is, <clears throat> you know, you searched, you open a room because you needed fresh air. It's kind of like, why did we, why were we always taught you attack from the unburned to the burn? Right. Clean air, D bad air. Exactly. Um, my, my comment really is is what we, not only should we ta be talking about flow path, but how many NIOSH reports, you know, have is there out there that um, firefighters run on an open hand line? Yeah. None. Right. Water is our friend. Right. When you're flowing. And, and, and if piece it's of this hot and if it's pushing you down, open line, keep it open. Exactly. Right. And you another know. piece of this whole thing is, is to pay, and we didn't give it the time it deserved, but to pay attention to the wind and, and get the wind at your back whenever and, possible. And I get it. My, my whole yeah. thing is, is if you're going interior, exterior, we're very aggressive interior. Yeah. But, but once you get in there. Flow. When, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Open your line. Right. Keep it open. Keep, and, and, you know, because a big thing, and, and like I say, this is just comments, and it's, if, if anybody has ever had nozzle forward, yeah. um, Good take class. a class. Great class. Right. It, and it's, it's very simplistic. It's back to sure. old stuff. I mean, yep. I have an uncle that retired in 81. He's 93 years old. He's still alive. And he'll tell you, eh, we just threw water and that's what we did. And, yeah. you know, what are you guys doing nowadays? You screwed everything up. And it's like, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, it's just kind of a comment, you know. Yeah, your, your flow path is very important. But once you get in there, if it's beating you down, open your line, keep it open. If, if you so, think about it, sometimes we let our training, that tail wag the dog, right? So in, in training environments, a lot of times we're always telling guys, shut down the line, shut down the line. Don't put the fire all the way out. And then we explain why, and we think that's sufficient. But the truth is it's not sufficient because that muscle no, memory is what they're going to bring to the fire ground. You're going to reset the you fire. Know. Yeah, we reset the fire. We reset yeah. the fire. But eventually we're going to reset the fire to the point where it's going to kick our ass, and then we lose a hand line, and then the next thing you know, guess what? You're going right. to a funeral. But anyway, to, your point, to your point, the incidence of firefighters with flow in water, uh, I don't necessarily agree it's zero. Uh, in Toledo, they were flow in water and they didn't survive. If you look at Cherry Road in Washington, D.C. Yeah. in 1999, as they were making the turn, they had two charged hand lines, but that fire was moving at 33 feet per second. They didn't have a chance to open that hand line. So I understand your point that if the conditions are getting hot, flow water, right? But you have to and anticipate. I'm sure there's anomalies, to... I, and, and I'm not saying there's not anomalies, and the flow path definitely right. important. I mean, sometimes it's, it makes sense if like where he's standing, if it's hot there and it's cool there, well, yeah, throw water from there and right. cool that environment right. down, and then you go in and you do your deal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Get that. I mean, you know, a lot of the fires, even the last one you showed, if someone was in there, are they alive? 
I mean, in, in, we it show depends up, if they have a door, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. But, but a lot of times we show up, we lose. Mm -hmm. I, I, unfortunately, we, that's what we do. We still show up, but, but sometimes, I mean, there's, uh, you know, just those inevitable times sure. where you're going to lose. So your point's very well taken. But, yeah. And I guess uh, what I'm trying to build off on that is we can classify them as anomalies or whatever. Your understanding of the research and the impact of air on that fire flow, the fire growth and the path, path of travel puts you in a better position to make those decisions when you're flowing water or where not to put yourself, right? So I think it all builds on it and it's an important point. Any other comments, questions? Nothing? Fair enough. So, because right. um, we got time left and you want to come up with a question, now you gotta listen to me. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'll show that, that one video. Show a video. He's finding a video. I'm going to ask you, how many officers in the room? How many guys are you responsible for? Two? Who else? How, how many are you responsible for? Three. Are any of them married? Do any of them have children? Do they have parents? How many people are you responsible for? Too often we think of this risk and all this stuff in terms of ourselves and our brothers and sisters next to us on the line. And that's fine. God bless you. But your decisions have impact way beyond the people on your company. And those decisions impact them for the rest of their lives. That child without a father, that spouse without a husband or a wife, that never changes. These guys are still dead. They're still maimed. They're still burned. Every decision we make has an extraordinary impact on a whole lot of people. Even when it's not the catastrophic death or injury, they have an extraordinary impact on a lot of people. And I would ask you from the bottom of my heart not to lose sight of that. It's not just about us. It's about our families. It's about our extended families. And it's about the citizens that we serve. Every decision we make has an extraordinary impact. And, and let's not forget that. And I, I'm glad you mentioned injuries. We tend to focus a lot on fatalities, but if we just look at the injuries and the significant, many of them are not only career changing, but life changing. And if you start to think not only the personal experience of those injuries, but the cost of those injuries. And NIST made an attempt to um, calculate what the lifetime cost of one year of injuries of firefighters was. So they looked at 2004, and they try to calculate in administrative costs, cost of medical care, cost of rehab, replacement costs, all of those costs that, that had to be factored in. And they estimated the lifetime cost of one year of injuries anywhere from $3.2 billion to $7.4 billion. So if you think not only the human cost of those injuries, if you start thinking of the financial cost to our local communities, it could be quite significant. We're continuously battling for a little piece of the pie of that budget, right? So if the human cost doesn't get you and you're a numbers person, start to look at the financial cost of those injuries. And if we could start bringing those injuries down and how that helps impact us uh, on, on the cost factor wise is also something that we need to consider. So we, we talk about the closure door. We, you know, Pete brought it up a number of times operationally. Uh, and this was something that we consistently saw throughout all of our research projects, whether it was the horizontal ventilation or the vertical ventilation. We saw conditions behind that door tenable for that occupant, right? So uh, we decided to make a public education campaign out of it, a close the door program. And we, we created this uh, animated video and put it on social media and it garnered 2 million hits. There's no public fire education or fire safety education program that's garnered this kind of support. And when you play the video, it's kind of funny. There's a cat coughing up a hairball or smoke, but many people were debating over whether it was smoke or a hairball. They were debating on the couple, right? But the fact, I didn't care what was driving the debate. Two million people watched that safety video on fires. So this led to the second iteration of it where we brought a marketing company in and we really thought about that Chevrolet commercial. So this is, the, this is what we tried to do. And all of this in is free for you. Of a fire, all of it's free. Who here thinks that you're safer sleeping with the doors open? I keep them open because I was a mom for so long. My kid's room is too 
doors down from mine. Always open. I'm not all that confident they would stop anything anyway. And these, these folks Harold, are hey, not actors. Ben, ben, They're nice quite honest. Harold, have a seat. Hi. Nice to meet you guys. Hello. 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 Right here. Chris, how are you? Great. about fire safety. What keeps you up at night? Yeah, I'm not too concerned. I probably don't think about a fire threat as much as I should, because I do forget to turn things off often. Have you ever been through one? A fire? No. We told you that you'd be coming here today for discussion, but what we didn't tell you is that there is also a demonstration that we want to show you. Sound good? introduce you to Steve, the director of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. I'll let Steve take it away. Welcome. My job is to lead a team of people that study how fire grows and spreads so we can keep you safe. Here at the Delaware County Emergency Services Training Center, we essentially turn this place into a laboratory. Uh, we've got several structures around here that we build to simulate where you live. And one of those structures is right here behind me. What I want you to do is I want to take you inside here and I want you to see how this looks like your home. And then once we get you outside, we're gonna go ahead and recreate what would happen if there was a fire in this structure right here. Look pretty normal? Yes. Yeah, got some furnishings. You'll notice the difference down here as we walk down. This bedroom door will be closed and the one at the end of the hall will be open. And what I want you to do is pay attention to comparison to the two of those and think about you and your family trying to survive this fire. All right, we just hit the button. We have ignition. Oh, boy. There she goes. Oh, man, that is scary. It's scary, right? Yeah, it's really Look, we have wow, smoke coming out over here already. Smoke's coming out. <gasps> what a lot of people don't realize is that the furnishings that are in our homes today are made of synthetic materials. So they burn so much faster than your old natural cotton-filled furnishings used to be. The statistics that we've seen through our research is in about 40 years ago, you had about 17 minutes to get out of your house after the smoke alarm sounded. Now you have less than three minutes. See, this is what we're, this is the things that we were. Oh my God. Whoa. Can you feel that? How can you survive that? <laughs> Seriously, that is insane. All right, go ahead, knock it down. All right, as you remember, closed door on the left, open door on the right. And you can see the dramatic wow. difference between the two with the simple closed door. Impressive. We want people to be as prepared as possible and understand the importance and how little time you have and what that simple barrier can provide to you and your family should you have a fire. I want you guys to throw some hard hats on and some safety glasses and at least poke your heads in the windows or you can even walk in the hallway if you want. Give me a word or phrase to describe what you just saw. Anxiety. Frightening. Terrifying. I really didn't expect anything like this. Ask you one last time, in the event of a fire, are you safe for sleeping with the doors open or the doors closed? Without a doubt, the door closed. Definitely with the doors closed, and from now on, the doors will be shut at night. <laughs> Definitely closed. Closed. Definitely closed. And I'm surprised by it. It's always great to be able to get the message out when we can take our research and get it out into the community to change behavior with the message of close before you doze. It, it feels great and hopefully we can save lives. If there was one bit of advice that you could give friends or family today, what would it be? Close before you doze. 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 
The key fire safety messages we want people to have are, one, have working smoke alarms in every level of your home, inside and outside every sleeping room. We want everybody to have an escape plan. Should you have a fire, you should know how to get out quickly. And if you can't get out quickly, having a closed door between you and where that fire is is critical to your survival. So that's just a public safety message. That has had 12 million hits today. So trying to get that message out, uh, not only to the fire service, but to the public as public education. Any materials you want for public education are free for downloading on the web page. If we're really serious about it's all about them and we don't leverage this, then there's some parts of us that are, that are hypocritical, right? Because preventing is the most important part. And uh, UL has started to engage more and more in the prevention message and what people can do if they do find themselves in these situations. And nobody can sell this message like those of us in the room here, right? So that's part of our obligation as well. You guys have been great. Thanks for putting up with us. Make sure you do your Appreciate evaluations. Yeah. Register to win. So thank you very much. Have a good week.